Journalist and author of best-selling books, Treasure Islands and Finance Curse, Nick Shackson is uh, keeping a close eye on this developing story and now joins us via Zoom from Berlin to share his observations. Uh, thanks very much indeed for joining us and welcome to the program. Hi, thanks. Good to talk to you. So just how um, much of an expose is this? I mean, have laws been broken or is this just embarrassing rather than criminal? Well, I mean, this is a very big expose. I mean, it's, it's bigger in data terms than the Panama Papers, which was an enormous quite global scandal. And there's a lot more politicians um, named than before. So this is this is very big. Um, the question of legality is, an, is, a, is a complicated one. For sure, lots of laws have been broken. Whenever there's um, tax havens used, there's always skullduggery involved. Not always, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of it around. And um, it's very difficult to prove um, breaking the law because what you have, and it's not illegal per se to own an offshore company as long as you declare it. And if you pay your taxes on it and, um, you know, if the law enforcement is after you, as long as you're transparent about it, that's kind of okay. But it does raise the question of why you would set up an offshore company company in the first place. The trouble is that um, when the ICIJ, which has done these leaks, um, finds out all this information, they've got troves of emails and all sorts of corporate structures and things like that. So they've got a lot of information. But if you show that somebody owns something, owns an offshore company that owns a lot of assets, for example, you, you have to then cross-check that against um, that person's tax affairs um, to see whether they actually declared it or not. And usually the tax affairs are confidential, so you can't cross-check it. So it's not possible to, to, to say for nearly all of these cases that anything illegal has been done. However, that is not to say, that is not to say that um, uh, it is all legal because that's definite. For, for, uh, you know, in my years of investigating sh offshore, usually when someone puts something offshore, it's for a nefarious reason. It's not always illegal by any means, but often it's abusive. Often it's bending the law, getting around the edges of the law. Um, so th there's a th there's a nasty stink here, a really big stink. Sometimes though, it's just um, clever tax planning, isn't it? <laughs> Well, one of the most worrying things about this whole saga and the sagas before it is what we've got here is a system for the elites, the, the billionaire classes, the most powerful, some of the most powerful people in the world, creating one set of, using the offshore system of tax havens to create one set of rules for them and another set of rules for everybody else. Um, you know, you and me can't afford, uh, I hope not to, uh, to, to, to set up complicated offshore trusts and companies in order to escape tax. These things are quite expensive and complicated. You need to get a lot of lawyers and accountants involved. But if you do, um, you can escape huge amounts of tax. So that's, I think, the fundamental problem. You know, tax is one aspect of it, but I think this is the rule of law. This is the system subverting the rule of law, just allowing these elites to get away with whatever they want to avoid, you know, the obligations of society that the rest of us have to put up with. So it's a, it's a really, really damaging. The offshore system is really, really damaging. And they hide behind words like clever tax planning and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, but in my book, it's, it's, it's one of the most dangerous developments that, of, of the modern global era. I suppose then what it means is that the um, uh, revenue collecting authorities in each country then has to look at what their citizens have declared because they're probably not going to get much help um, from one country to the next. For example, we're hearing that uh, Nevada and um, uh, South Dakota have got secrecy laws there now that potentially are going to embarrass the American government because information just won't be revealed. Well, there's a couple of problems here. One is that in the country that's losing the money, so um, if you take an African country, for example, um, it may be the president who's involved in the in the dirty dealings. So and they're not going to want to even investigate it. So there's that's that's the first problem. And um, you know, as these papers have shown a lot of um, very powerful people are involved and they are, as with previous leaks, very involved in covering up what's been going on and ensuring that investigators go the wrong way or don't look at all. The other problem, of course, is yes, indeed. Um, you pointed to South Dakota as an example. In the United States, I went there and they, they specialize in, in just basically one street in um, Sioux Falls in South Dakota. There's a bunch of people who specialize in setting up really clever trusts, which um, just hide your assets in an anonymity. You put your assets into one of these trusts and then it's very hard to get 
get um, money out of them. And the United States has been for many years a major tax haven because um, the world's criminals and tax evaders and, and shady people have been stashing their assets in the, in the United States. And the United States has not been providing the information in return to those home countries' governments. Maybe if it's a powerful country, there'll be some sort of cooperation arrangement. And there are indeed now international schemes that have been emerging in the last few years to kind of help countries share information. But they're full of holes. And if it's a weak country, if it's a poor country, if it's an African country, for example, asking money from Switzerland or the United Kingdom or the United States, the bankers there are, are, are able to sort of dictate policy. And um, and they're very, you know, the, the African countries um, in a kind of supplicant position, Very, it's going to be very hard to get any information. But having said that, there have been some improvements um, in recent years. And the United States under the Biden administration has been um, making some improvements to transparency. So it's a long way to go, but, um, but it's a very difficult thing. So um, how has this been allowed to carry on for, for so long? It seems like almost like an open secret that it goes on. Yeah, I mean, so many people wonder, you know, why don't the, why don't the big powerful countries send in the gun, gunboats and just shut these places down? And it is a very good question. I mean, one of the reasons is, you know, what I've already mentioned is that um, the politicians and the most powerful people in these countries are the ones who are using the system to, um, you know, escape the rule of law. And so it's very difficult to crack down because they're the ones making the policy. Um, and that happens in, you know, both rich and, and poor countries. So that's the first level of problems. You also, um, you know, as you mentioned, you do need international cooperation. And the, and the next problem here is that Generally, tax havens tend to be rich countries or satellites of rich countries. And by satellites, I mean countries like places like the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, Jersey or Guernsey, which are satellites of the United Kingdom. They're sort of half independent, but also half controlled by the UK, the, the sort of flotsam and jetsam of the British Empire, um, if you will. And these places um, receive the money. And the UK, a lot of this money comes into the city of London in, in the UK. And so the UK sees all this money coming in, you know, and they, don't, you know, people don't like the idea that Africa is being looted, for example. But then they see the money coming in and they think, well, let's not crack down too much. And so you have, you know, it, there's another, it's a political, again, another political problem at a country level. Um, also, you've had for so many years this kind of low tax, low government ideology that everyone should sort of, um, you know, and, and that means low enforcement, low enforcement of criminal laws, low enforcement of tax laws, cutting resources for the tax authorities. I know that's been happening in, in South Africa and in many other countries. Um, and, and this, you know, cutting of resources for the, uh, for the tax authorities um, and forces of law and order is a major problem. And if there's one kind of, you know, there's no silver bullet to solve this problem, but if there's one thing above all that needs doing, and that's to start giving the tax authorities and the, and the international criminal authorities proper resources to start chasing this stuff. 2.94 uh, terabytes of data. Uh, does that mean that um, we've only just un unearthed a portion of, uh, of what's there and that there's still so much more that could uh, come out? Oh, yeah, this is just a window into the system. I mean, this is, there is, you know, if you think of all the countries, um, you know, from, you know, from Europe to Africa to Asia to, to North and South America, all the kind of corrupt people, the crooks, the ne'er-do-wells in all of these countries, um, they use, it's routine in China, you know, it's routine for the elites in these countries to use tax havens. So we've only seen, you know, uh, 330 politicians have been exposed by this late, latest leak, and I think another 130 billionaires. But this is just a, this is just a kind of, um, you know, a peek into the system. This is a big system that is, um, you know, it's routinely used. And this is just, you know, these leaks, even though they're very big and very significant, um, they're just a really, they're just the tip of the iceberg. The journalistic operation itself uh, must be, I mean, on a, on a level unseen before. Something, what, 600 journalists, 150 media outlets in 117 countries. How does one even coordinate all of this? 
Well, they've had practice. I mean, this started really with the Panama Papers, this big expose of, of data that the ICIJ got. They got this sort of anonymous leak from this whistle, whistleblower blower that started just sending them more and more data. And they realized um, it, it initially went to a German newspaper and they, they realized um, the Süddeutsche Zeitung and they realized there's no way they could process all this stuff. So they got in touch with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and they started putting together some systems and they started putting together you know, IT systems um, they started getting newspapers together. Journalists had to collaborate across borders because there's, you know, a file in one place tells you one thing and then you have to understand a file in another place. And a lot of these things are quite complicated. And, you know, trusts, for example, are very deliberately, very slippery mechanisms that allow people to kind of worm their way around the laws. And, um, and so you need experts in that. You need accounting experts. And so they did... They did start to coordinate this, and then they, more and more leaks started come, coming. You had the, the, the Paradise Papers, for example. You had Mauritius leaks. You had Luanda leaks with um, the affairs of um, Isabel dos Santos in, in Angola. Um, and all these different leaks. It, basically, the ICIJ became the go-to place for most leaks. Um, uh, there are some other organizations doing it, but they, they just have put, put together systems. And, you know, there's you've got all these kind of files and some, some stuff, sort of just PDFs of, of photocopies and stuff like that. And they had to work out how to kind of collate all this stuff and get IT systems to sort of scrape words and scrape names and stuff like that and put it all together. So it has been a, a mammoth operation. Um, and there's still a lot more to come in this particular leak as well. Um, they're still putting this together and they've got a whole thing called the offshore leaks database, which you can go to and you can search for names in it and um, they will give you a certain amount of information um, about, you know, links and companies that are, that, that are in there. So yeah, it's a huge operation. And some really uh, embarrassing uh, names have uh, come up. I mean, there's this property that's been sold to the Queen and one has to ask, how much did the Queen's Crown Estate know about the transaction? I guess they probably knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, well, the Queen is a very interesting case because, you know, as I mentioned, Britain is one of the world's most important tax havens and it runs this sort of satellite of international tax havens. And the Queen, you know, her head is on the stamps and the banknotes of these places. And she, um, we actually, me and a, a, a colleague at the Tax Justice Network wrote a letter to the Queen a few years ago saying, you know, you need to do something about this. Um, and I sent her my book, Treasure Islands, and um, she wrote back, you know, saying basically, we've, you know, we've seen your book, but um, it's not our responsibility. It's the politicians, you know, the UK politicians responsibility. So go and talk to them. So it is embarrassing for the Queen. Um, and uh, but, you know, it, she's just part of the establishment in the UK. Um, and she's just, you know, she's a figurehead. And I think when you're going to have so many complicated profit um, ownerships and properties all over the place, like the Queen does, you're probably going to end up um, with offshore stuff somewhere. Um, and yeah, she's inevitably was going to be tangled up in this stuff because it's part of the, you know, this is, this suffuses the whole British establishment. Um, you know, offshore is where so much, um, you know, so many of the politicians um, have got rich, done business, um, sometimes broken laws, sometimes some often not. But, uh, you know, David Cameron, former prime minister, was caught in the, one of the last leaks. Um, and it was very embarrassing for him. So, yeah, it's all over the place in the UK.